It's time for questions to the Minister of Health. We we'll start with listed questions. Before we start, could I remind members to continue to um, rise in their places if they wish to ask a supplementary question. Otherwise, I will assume that you no longer wish to ask your question. I call Christopher Stalford. My department is working closely with the Health and Social Care Board in developing an elective care plan to arrest the decline in elective waiting times and deliver sustainable improvements in the medium to longer term across all specialities. Um, as well as maximising the number of patients who can be treated in the community, the plan will ensure that existing funded capacity in the health service is fully maximised and targets new re um, recurrent investment to expand the health service's capacity to meet patient demand. However, it will require significant additional funding to deliver this. I will continue to engage with my executive colleagues to secure the additional investment necessary to transform the delivery of services. As with all specialities, um, trusts are continuing to work with the Health and Social Care Board to minimise dental waiting times within the resources available. Patients are treated on the basis of clinical urgency, with patients of equal clinical priority being seen in chronological order. The Board is also currently working with trusts and referring practitioners to finalise the rollout of referral guidelines, which aim to reduce the number of unnecessary referrals for consultant-led dental treatment and thereby allow clinicians to focus on patients who require treatment. Christopher Stalford for a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. In the vein that prevention is better than cure, could the Minister outline for us what collaborative efforts are being made between her department and perhaps the Department of Education or other departments in terms of educating particularly our young people about the need to protect their teeth in order that hopefully they don't have to avail of dentistry as much as is the case presently? I mean, absolutely agree with the member in terms of um, prevention better than cure, and we need to do more to prevent tooth care from happening in the first place, because that would obviously be the ideal scenario. We have our regional um, preschool prevention programme called Happy Smiles for Children and Nurseries, and all trusts deliver programmes similar to the Tooth Brushing Challenge, which is delivered in the Belfast Trust from primary four onwards. Evidence has grown that where prevention programmes are targeted towards young children, a reduction of up to 30% in disease level can be reached and I want our children to be the beneficiaries of, of all these successful prevention programmes. My department has also provided funding for tooth decay prevention campaigns over the years. For example, since 2005, 100,000 has been provided to trust to target children in deprived areas. So I think it's important that we continue to do more of that type of preventative type work. And certainly um, in terms of going forward and looking to the future, I want to really focus on prevention and not just in relation to tooth decay, but right across the piece. I think it's important that we prevent people from actually getting um, to a state of where they need to use hospital services, for example. So prevention is very key in terms of my, one of my priorities. Here, sir, Jerry Mullen. I call Jerry Mullen. Deputy Speaker, uh, I thank the Minister for her answers so far. But, uh, and I would agree that the case of young, Connell Young has been very distressing uh, and has become very, very um, widespread in the media re recently. But in terms of the Western Trust Minister, um, have you considered providing undergraduate training uh, in dental studies at, univer at Ulster University in Korean uh, so as to alleviate the problem of uh, staff shortages and to reduce ever increasing locum costs on dentists? Um, I don't have any information in relation to the Western Trust specifically. I'm happy to provide that to the member in writing, but I think that there obviously are challenges for the Western Trust, but I suppose there's a challenge for many trusts in relation to workforce issues and being able to recruit people. We have an over-reliance on locums and that's not the, the place we want to be in. So we need to transform health and social care. We need a real um, meaningful workforce plan that allows us to actually recruit the staff. And it is very difficult to recruit staff. You can see quite often that a number of trusts go out to recruitment and can't actually recruit people into, into the post. So we need to do more to, to arrest that picture, I think, and to change the, the picture. But in relation to the Western Trust specifically, I don't have specifics, but I will write to the member. I call Robbie Butler. Deputy Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your answers uh, so far. And the, the current problems in dental waiting lists would, of course, be significantly worse if it weren't for the preemptive actions of Michael Majimsey in 2009. It's just unfortunate similar attention wasn't shown by successors. Uh, can the Minister confirm how many of the dental... <laughs> Can the Minister confirm how many of the dental graduates who applied for work in Northern Ireland last year were able to find training posts here? 
I'm sure Michael will be very glad to hear you still singing his praises um, after he's left the house. <laughs> but um, I don't have the figures in relation to, to, to the, but I'm happy to, to respond to the member in writing and give him the, the stats just in relation to the number of people that were successful in their recruitment. Call Stuart Dixon. For the answers to your question thus far. Minister, given the evidence that fluoride is one of the major contributors to improvement in dental health and hygiene, what action are you taking to ensure that fluoride could be placed in our public water supply? I think that it's one of those issues which is um, quite emotive and, and quite topical and I think some people don't want to be forced to have fluoride in their water and I think that's a legitimate and, and genuine concern. So um, it's something that we obviously keep under review. Any decisions I take will be based on clinical assessment of whether or not they're, they're based on, on it's the right thing to do for the person's outcome. So um, I will always be guided by that and that's the same scenario in relation to fluoride in water. I'm Sarah Pat Sheehan. I call Pat Sheehan. I've got a uh, to question too, please. On the 28th of September, I announced the appointment of the design team for the early works at Desert Creek. This is a positive step forward in the development of a much needed new fire and rescue service training facility. Early works on the ground at Desert Creek are expected to commence in spring 2017. The total forecast capital investment is approximately 45 million and the main design includes a fire station, teaching accommodation, multi-purpose training warehouse, hothouse, swift water and skid pan facilities at Desert Creek. The main capital works are expected to commence in by late 2018. The training centre, once completed and operational, will provide a facility in which our firefighters can learn the skills they need to keep the public and themselves safe. Training opportunities will include addressing fires in confined spaces and intense smoke, rapid water as, a, as in flood rescues and the outcome of road traffic accidents. The local community in Mid-Ulster will be fully engaged during the process of the development of Desert Creek, and I have written to the Chief Executive of Mid-Ulster Council offering to meet the Chief Executive and all elected members regarding this important investment. I call Pat Sheehan for a supplementary. Gurma, I've got a free last one, Corla. August Gwon Bwaka Sleishanara, Sok de Fragra. I thank the Minister for her very comprehensive answer, and I wonder, could she give us a timeline for the completion of Desert Creek? Gurma, I would. With the design team now in place from, from last month, they have been tasked with um, undertaking necessary design work to progress the approved works. We hope that early works will um, start in spring of 2017 and the approval of the main works through the approval of an outline business case is planned for the first half of 2018. So main construction works are planned to uh, commence in late 2018 and estimated to take just over two years to complete um, in 2020-21. Called Sandra Overend. Uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for this information. Um, the so-called Community Safety College that was to be built in Desert Creek was to be finished last year, um, and, uh, and was in order to, it was supposed to bring something like 1,500 to 2,000 jobs in construction um, at that time, and unfortunately that all fell through, and Mid Ulster has been left very sore. Um, with regard to the Desert Creek project, can the Minister provide such similar um, figures for this current project in terms of construction and, and how does you feel it will benefit Mid Ulster? Well I can confirm that it's going to be an investment in Mid Ulster of £45 million and I'm very aware as the member is um, in relation to the concerns over the years about um, the project and whether or not it was actually going to come to Mid Ulster at all. So um, I think we've finalised the case and I can say categorically without any um, doubt that the project will go ahead, that we're, we've appointed the design team, that the, the works are going to be uh, delivered and we hope to have staff training there and working from there from 2020-21 financial year. So it's £45 million investment from Ulster. It's something that I know that the, um, the council have been lobbying very strongly on and um, as I said I'm going to go into the council and, and talk to them to give them assurances that the project's going to uh, be going ahead. But I do think that it's, um, the people of Ulster deserve and, and want uh, and crave the information and, and the confirmation that the project's going to go ahead but I'm certainly committed to delivering it in this mandate. Sir Raymond McCartney. I call Raymond McCartney. Ask My GP is a telephone and web based patient triage system which is currently being piloted in four GP practices here, including Abbey and Aberfoyle. Patients contacting their GP practice for an, for an appointment are asked to provide responses to a series of questions about their condition, either over the telephone or online. These responses are then passed to the GP who makes a decision about the most appropriate course of action to respond to that patient's needs. For some patients, this might be to refer to another healthcare professional for advice or treatment. 
ensuring that those patients who do not need to be seen by a GP can be seen quickly. The initial results from the pilot exercise have been extremely positive. Patients asking uh, or using the Ask My GP um, app have received a call back from their GP or their other care professionals in around 30 to 40 minutes and often much sooner. In those cases where a patient needs to be seen, they're being seen on the same day. Across the GP pilot practices, 94% of patients using Ask My GP were either satisfied or very satisfied with the service. GPs have also been extremely positive about the impact of the new service on their ability to meet patient demand and, reduce, and the reduced pressure on their working day. Work has now commenced to extend the pilot to a further 30 GP practices. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answer? Indeed, welcome this initiative, indeed, the positivity which surrounds it. Uh, as well, alongside this uh, initiative, can the Minister perhaps outline what our investment that there will be in general practice? In 2015 um, 16, an investment package of up to 5.1 million was agreed for general medical services, including additional funding of 3.1 million to build capacity in GP out of our services, up to 1.2 million to increase skills mix in general practice and to help meet demand for blood tests and other diagnostic work, and up to 300,000 to recruit and retain GPs. Further, non-recurrent funding was also provided uh, last year to pilot a phone and online triage system, which we've just discussed. Uh, in December last year, a five-year initiative was launched to place um, up to 300 pharmacists in GP practices by 2021, with an associated total investment rising up to £14 million per year. This will mean that, where appropriate, patients can be given advice and assistance directly by a pharmacist, with GP time freed up for those patients who most need to see them. The first wave of pharmacists has been recruited. Over 35 whole-time equivalent posts have been filled, with staff starting to take up posts from mid-September. The second wave of recruitment is underway, with um, three currently being planned. With wave three currently being planned, in January of this year, investment of 1.2 million per year was secured to increase the number of GP training places to 85 each year, up from 65. And as part of the GMS contract settlement for 16-17, up to a further 7 million will be invested in general practice including 2 million to meet the additional demand for GP services, 1.7 million to continue to roll out the practice-based um, pharmacist programme, and 160,000 to develop online booking and repeat prescribing systems. These systems will be available to every GP practice that wishes to adopt them, and will mean that people can access their GP surgery online at a time that's convenient for them. Mark Durkin. I call Mark Durkin. A free yes, John Collier, and I thank the Minister for her answers. Thus far, I also would very much welcome this scheme and indeed many of the initiatives that the Minister outlined there of hers that will alleviate uh, pressure from our GPs. On the issue of recruitment and retention of GPs, does the Minister see that perhaps a, a new medical school in the North West could go some way to uh, increasing the number of people coming into and remaining in general practice? <coughs> There are obvious um, challenges in relation to recruiting um, GPs, and particularly for rural GP practices, they're having particular challenges. So um, I'm, I'm very keen to, uh, there has been a working group in relation to the GP-led care working group, which has reported back to me, and I'm very keen to take forward a number of the recommendations from that group, which particularly will be looking at the recruitment and retention of GPs. I think that in the Northwest, there are particular challenges, and we in a previous question, I talked about the, the challenges in relation to dental, um, services and recruiting dentists, but it's the same right across the piece. In the Western Trust area, it's difficult in terms of recruitment. Would a medical school in that area help? I think it would. And um, I'm very keen to progress in that, and I have had some discussions with the university in relation to actually taking that forward. So I'm very keen that that, that would happen. I think it would really help in terms of the workforce um, challenges which we have in, in that area. Call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I uh, thank the Minister uh, for, for the schemes that she's announced, and uh, I think they'll be very welcome, particularly the uh, Ask My GP scheme, and you mentioned that it will be uh, extended to, to 30 other practices. How long do you foresee that this, uh, the, the pilots will last, uh, and when will there be possibly a rollout right across uh, the province? Yeah, I mean, I think that the feedback has been so positive, as I said, 94% of people said they were satisfied or very satisfied, and this is available now to extend the pilot is available to any GP practice that wants to avail of it, and we've actually put some funding in place to, um, to support that. So I think that given that there is some funding there, it allows GPs maybe to adapt and, and bring in something which um, 
could be, could be difficult just in the start in terms of bedding, bedding it in. So I, I'm very keen that we roll it out right across the piece if we can. I think GPs are very keen to do that. They want to see the people that need to be seen and they want to see them in a, in a, in a sort of in the same day if, ne if necessary. And I think this scheme, Ask My GP scheme, has obviously shown that it does work and that actually allows GPs to free up their time to be able to see people. So um, I'm very keen that we roll it out right across, across the board and I think the GPs are very keen that that will happen too. Call Paula Bradshaw. Very much, um, Minister. I just want to continue on that last point there. And um, you've said you've put out a call for the, the rollout to the next um, 30 GP practices. How do you plan, if, if you get oversubscribed, how do you plan then to decide which ones will get the rollout to the next stage? Well, I think that it's important. Uh, GPs are asking for this. GPs are asking for support to, to, for, to allow them to see people in a more um, timely fashion. GPs are distraught and distressed if they can't see people in, in the day and people are having to wait for a number of days to get appointments. So this to me is, is something that's about real transformation. It's about doing things differently and it's allowing, people, allowing them to be freed up with their time. So I don't think we're going to get to a point where we can't support GPs to do this. This is something that actually is going to deliver better outcomes for people. And I think that um, this, the investment itself isn't even on the scheme of things. It isn't a massive financial investment, but it actually makes a real difference. So I don't think there's going to be an issue in terms of competition and who gets, who gets the service. It's going to be an issue of um, how quickly we can roll it out and then how everybody embraces it. Aaron, sir, Stephen Agnew. I called Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four, please. One of the objectives of the homeless, uh, homelessness strategy is to improve services to vulnerable homeless households and individuals. This, impacts, this objective impacts on the health and social care service in a number of ways, particularly in relation to mental health, domestic and sexual violence and substance misuse. Officials from my department and the Public Health Agency participate in the Homelessness uh, Strategy Steering Group and contribute to addressing policy and service delivery issues in partnership with the Department for Communities, the Housing Executive and the range of voluntary and community sector organisations which provide assistance and outreach to homeless people. In addition, I'm a member of the Interministerial Group on Rough Sleeping and Homelessness and I know that Minister Given is um, convening a meeting of that group shortly and I will um, obviously attend that meeting. Health and social care is available on the basis of clinical need to everyone equally, including homeless people and rough sleepers. Care and treatment are delivered in the appropriate primary, community and secondary settings when required. While services uh, are available, it's accepted that there may be increased difficulties in homeless people and rough sleepers assessing those services, and that is a key area that the Department is considering in conjunction with the Public Health Agency. We are all aware of the tragic deaths of five homeless people in Belfast last winter. Concerns were raised in relation to a possible lack of communication between health services and homeless people problems with access to mental health and addiction treatment, and the lack of arrangements with social um, services when homeless patients are discharged from emergency departments or inpatient care. Those concerns are being addressed. The Department for Communities is leading on an interdepartmental action plan to address some of the problems that are specific to Belfast. And my department, the Public Health Agency and the Belfast Trust, are responsible for addressing two key actions, namely developing arrangements to ensure that people discharged from hospital who do not have access to accommodation are signposted effectively to existing services, and assessing the services available in relation to alcohol and drug early intervention, harm reduction and treatment and support for services. Can the Minister bring her remarks to a close? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her thorough answer. Um, she made reference to mental health and substance misuse, and obviously the best uh, solution to homelessness is to prevent the homelessness um, in the first place. Um, so could I ask the Minister, um, will she give a commitment that she sends sufficiently senior officials to the Homeless Strategy Steering Group um, to ensure that decisions can be made and to ensure that they can look at addressing issues such as detox facilities? Yes, I can um, make sure that happens. It's not just about um, a nod to the issue, it's actually about being real and meaningful um, engagement. So I'm, I'm, I'm certainly make sure that's the case that the relevant officials go along and also then um, I will show the leadership in terms of attending the ministerial group, which I think is really important in terms of um, showing the significance of the issue and the priority that we give to the issue. Call Paula Bradley. And I can, can I thank the Minister for her answers so far? Um, we all know and we discuss constantly in Health Committee and in this chamber about health inequalities, and one of the biggest health inequalities is amongst 
our uh, homeless community, um, especially when I think of Belfast, my own area. And I know of all the innovative work that is being done by the health and social care staff. Um, could I ask the minister if she could look at some of that innovative work and maybe roll that out across our other cities within Northern Ireland? Because I know Belfast and some of our nursing staff there especially are doing some great work. Yes, and I, I mean, obviously I concur with you in relation to the work that staff do um, on the front line, engaging with people, trying to make a difference, trying to support them. So um, I think it's my job in order to support those staff to do what they do well. I think that um, we, we should be innovative, and I'm always open to looking at new ideas and, and good practice and rolling it out where, um, where it's, it's proven to, to work. So um, anything, any initiatives that are happening, if, they're, if they work, um, we should be obviously replicating that right across the whole of the north to ensure we deliver the best support we possibly can for those people who find themselves homeless. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm just following on from some of the answers already. Just the Minister has out outlined um, issues associated with mental health and substance misuse. Can the Minister inform the House as to what services are available to assist those homeless people who suffer from both mental health and uh, substance misuse. Um, th there is substantial demand for addiction and mental health services for young people throughout the region and services are under constant pressure. In Belfast, the demand for drug and alcohol mental health services has resulted in it becoming a very specialist team with a large consultative role, only directly dealing with very high-risk individuals. Step 3, CAMS, community services continue to see and treat young people who have either significant mental health issues as a result of their substance misuse for example, psychotic presentation or those who have comorbid mental health and substance misuse issues. Regionally, the PHA has confirmed recurrent investment in dams and trusts are currently in the process of recruiting to those teams. In addition, the range of alcohol and drug education, early intervention and treatment and support services were launched in July of 2015 across all of the five health and social care trust areas. A number of these services are targeted specifically at children and young people and their families and work is ongoing to improve awareness of the services. It will, of course, require time uh, of, for these relatively new services to bed in properly and to allow for meaningful assessment of their effectiveness. In the meantime, the need for any additional support will continue to be monitored and kept under review. Call Joanne Dobson. Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, does the Minister agree with me that a key tool to ending scenes of people sleeping rough on our streets of Northern Ireland would be to place a statutory duty to prevent homelessness on public services such as NHS, and will she give this consideration? See, I don't, I don't think it's just the responsibility of the health service. I think it's a holistic response. It should be cross-departmental, obviously. It's in relation to a home, a house. It's in relation to people's um, mental health, their physical well-being. I think it's right across the piece. So I think that if we were going to, to legislate for that, then it would have to obviously be cross-departmental. But I certainly would be open to, to looking at all of that. We should be doing absolutely everything we possibly can to prevent anyone be becoming homeless. And whatever supports we can provide, then we should be providing them. So I'm very open to um, working with executive colleagues to make sure that we deliver the best possible outcomes we can. Aaron, sir, Nicola Mellon. I call Nicola Mellon. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for her commitment to showing leadership on the issue of homelessness? Um, but I, could I ask her, is she satisfied that her department is currently doing all it can, working with other government departments and partners outside of government, to prevent and tackle homelessness? Yes, I have no reason to, to believe otherwise. I think that, um, as, as I said earlier, I think that um, we have some fantastic, amazing health line, health care workers working on the front line, working with people, engaging with people, trying to prevent homelessness, worried about um, the patients they deal with. So I think that they do an excellent job. Um, I have no reason to doubt that my department is in any way found wanting in terms of um, working cross-departmentally and working with other agencies, working with the community and voluntary sector. But if the member has any issues in particular she wants to raise, then I'd be very happy to, to receive that information. I call Nelson McCausland. Question number five. There are no current plans to review the regulations relating to applications by community pharmacies to relocate their premises. The Health and Social Care Board is required to make arrangements for the provision of community pharmacy services, which includes dispensing drugs prescribed by prescribers. It does this by contracting out these services to the independent retail pharmacies and a community pharmacy contractor can only dispense health service prescriptions if they are included in the pharmaceutical list maintained by the Health and Social Care Board. If a community pharmacy contractor wishes to relocate within the neighbourhood in which they already provide services and to provide the same pharmaceutical services without interruption, they can make an application to the Health and Social Care Board. 
The change of premises must be within the neighbourhood of the premises currently occupied, and the same services must be provided to essentially the same population. If the board agrees that the relocation is minor and satisfied that the pharmaceutical services which are provided from the existing premises will be provided from the new premises, and that there will be no interruption in the provision of those services, except as allowed by the board, it must grant the application. In reaching this decision, the board must take account of the views of, the commun of community pharmacy NA. A minor relocation is one where there will be no significant change in the population served and other circumstances are such that there will be no appreciable effect on the pharmaceutical services provided by the applicant or any other community pharmacy in the neighbourhood. If the board decides a relocation is not minor, the application is treated as if it were a new application to join the pharmaceutical list. I call Nelson McCausland for a supplementary. Um, the reason I, I raise this question is that there are occasions where why it would seem to be the logical thing to have some form of co-location or near location between a pharmacy and um, a GP surgery. Um, you can get situations where um, there are objections then from other pharmacies. And um, I think some of the outcomes um, would encourage the minister to look at the outcomes in view of the fact that sometimes the decisions that are made can be disadvantageous, I think, to, to local communities. Um, where a change of location might be actually beneficial. Uh, it was really to look at past decisions and maybe just in the light of that to consider whether there is some merit in reviewing it. Okay, I can take on board what, what the member says. I'm, I'm not, the issue hasn't been highlighted with me as, as an issue of concern, but I, I take on board what you've said now and I and I'm ask officials to look into it. Aaron Sarri and Milne. I just break as fast as on Ira. At the moment. Um, Minister, could I ask you there for your assessment of the role of the community, pharm of community pharmacy in supporting reform uh, of the health and social care system? Community pharmacies clearly have a, a real strong role in terms of supporting the reform of health and social care system. They help people to get well and stay well. They dispense approximately 40 million prescription items a year, providing advice and information about medicines and healthy lifestyles as well as offering services to improve the safe, effective use of medicines <clears throat> and to support self-care and prevention. There are currently 533 community pharmacies employing highly qualified pharmacists supported by dedicated healthcare teams. Community pharmacies are therefore an important resource within local communities and it's estimated that on a daily basis approximately 9% of the population visit a community pharmacy. My department's vision for community pharmacy contribution to the reform of the health and social care system is set out in a number of strategic documents which are currently being implemented, including transforming your care, making it better through pharmacy in the community, and the medicines optimization quality framework. Optimizing the benefits of medicine is an important enabler of reform, and the skilled community pharmacy workforce are applying their clinical skills to better, help better achieve better outcomes for patients and promote healthy lifestyles. Community pharmacies also support reform by helping reduce demand on GP and other acute services through the provision of advice and treatment of common complaints without the need for a doctor's appointment. I call Harl McKay. Madam, Principal Deputy Speaker, it is unfortunate that a major high street pharmacy is offering free flights and accommodation to entice pharmacists specifically to relocate from Northern Ireland to England. Can the Minister give a commitment that under the current regulations, approval for such relocations are only granted when it is determined such a move would not disproportionately affect the existing patients groups which use it? I think that's what I tried to set out in terms of the initial answer in relation to the, the factors which the board takes into account whenever they're um, deciding whether or not someone can relocate. It has to be about serving the population. I think community pharmacy is an excellent resource which we, we um, can, and can do so much more and want to do so much more in terms of supporting people. Um, I think I read somewhere one time that um, more people, particularly in deprived areas, more people are more likely to go and seek the advice of their pharmacists than, they, than even going to their GP. So that's a resource I think that we need to use more and I certainly want to work with community pharmacy. But in relation to the um, relocation of pharmacies, the board takes all, those fact, all the factors which I outlined into account whenever they're deciding whether or not something is allowed to go ahead or not. Sir Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, um, I welcome the Minister's comments that she values the work of the community pharmacy and sees an enhanced role in the future. Can the Minister give an assurance that in packaging up that enhanced role there will also be sufficient budget to run alongside it? Minister. Yes, I, I think that, um, as I said, I do really very much value the work that Community Pharmacy provides and we're currently in the process of um, agreeing on new contractual arrangements with Community Pharmacy and I think that will obviously 
all be part of, um, part of that discussion and part of that contract agreement. I think that pharmacy, and I know that pharmacy wants to do so much more, and I, and I want to work with them to allow us to, to be able to do that. They deliver really, really high patient outcomes. They really maximise um, the frontline engagement, I think, with, with, with individuals who, who come in and ask for advice. So I think that um, there's an appetite there within community pharmacy to do more, and I want to work with them to make sure that we do um, support them to deliver more. Shin and Gerald Leshanam, the Keshna List Jalta. That ends the period for list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Alan Chambers. Principal Speaker. Uh, Minister, as we stand here today, there are one in five of the population on a waiting list. Uh, those include 33,600 outpatients who have been waiting longer than a year, 93% of red flag breast cancer patients in the Southern Trust not been seen within the 14 days, and thousands waiting for non-elective surgery in the Ulster Hospital, including many of my constituents. These are all people who are in pain and enduring major disruption of their quality of life. What advice or hope can you offer these people and their families? Well, I can share the members' concern in relation to waiting times. I've said from a check up office that um, some of the waiting times are totally unacceptable, and we need to transform how we deliver health and social care so we don't have people sitting on, on waiting lists. I have inherited, I think, I think what we have in terms of health and social care is an outdated system that's trying to deliver 21st century health and social care. So we have to transform how we deliver care in order to bring down waiting lists. So I'm certainly committed to that and I've told the House that I intend to um, announce my way forward in relation to how we're going to transform health and social care and I'm going to do that over the next number of weeks because I think that um, the waiting lists, and, we, and whether it be for um, last week we discussed breast cancer referrals, whether it be for autism assessments, no matter what it is, the waiting list situation shouldn't, um, can't continue the way it is. We have to address it, and I've said that it's a priority for me to be able to do that. Alan Chambers for supplementary. Minister, many people are awaiting the much-delayed publication of the Bengoa report. Can the minister give, first of all, give an account for the delay, and secondly, can she give a commitment that it will be published in totality? and nothing in the original report withheld. And the Minister can choose to answer which of the questions that she answered. Um, I have already said publicly that I intend to publish the, the document and I will do so on the 25th of October so you can get your reading ready for that day. I have said that, I've told the Health Committee that that's what I'm going to do. Um, there will be nothing held back. It, it will, I will publish um, Professor Bengoa and the panel report but alongside that, more importantly, I will publish how I intend to take things forward and how I intend to transform health and social care and how I intend to deliver better outcomes and how I intend to bring down waiting lists and I think that that's a piece of work that which we all and I look forward to engaging with everybody in, in relation to that because I think this is a time we have an opportunity here I think to show leadership, to show political leadership and also working with clinicians to um, make sure we have clear patient pathways, make sure that we have a better system that delivers 21st century care for all those people who need health and social care services. I call Paula Bradley for Oh, excuse me, I call Paula Bradshaw for a uh, topical question. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Can I ask um, if you intend to instruct your department to authorise the commissioning of Nifolumam, which, um, which is part of a combined immunotherapy life extending cancer treatment um, that was just recently authorised in England because of its effectiveness? I don't have the detail in relation to that specific drug. Um, I will always be led by clinical guidance and, and the professionals, so um, I'm happy to, to take a look at it, but I don't have the information with me in relation to that particular drug. Well, Paula Bradshaw for supplementary. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll certainly provide that to you. I'm just wondering, um, carrying on, in terms of uh, access to cancer drug treatments, um, where are we at with the task and finish group in terms of the review of the individual funding requests and when will we get um, information on how that's going to change in the future? I don't have a particular time frame, but I believe it's, it's very, um, over the next number of weeks I think I intend to get the report and then I'll make decisions on the way forward. I think it's important that we have and we provide clear um, information for people who may need specialist um, drugs, whether that be for cancer or for, for anything else. So, um, the piece of work has been really useful, but I intend to I think I, uh, take receipt of that over the next number of weeks. Then I'm happy to provide the House with information in relation to how we take it forward. Alex Maskey is not in this place. Kiva Archibald is not in her place. I call Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> Can the Minister provide an, uh, an update to the House on the Ministerial Working Group on FFAs, Fatal Fetal Abnormalities? 
and outline a time scale as to when she expects the recommendations of this working group to be published. The Justice Minister and I agreed the membership and the terms of reference for the Fatal Fetal Abnormality Working Group on the 5th of July, and that group has been working um, over the summer and over the last number of months considering the care and support provided to women and their families when a fatal fetal abnormality diagnosis has been given, considering and also including um, giving consideration to legislative changes. The group has met on several occasions and I expect to actually receive their report in the coming days, which I will then obviously bring to the Executive along with the Justice Minister. I call Danny Kennedy for a supplementary. Thank the Minister for her uh, eyes uh, thus far. Prior to the publication of the working group recommendations, what actions uh, are being taken, Minister, by your department to provide care and support services for women who, provide themsel uh, who find themselves carrying an unborn child with life limiting disability? I think that, um, well, obviously, there's clear guidance that's been published and, and is with all trusts. I think any um, woman, any family that finds themselves in a scenario where they have a diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality is a desperate situation. It's a situation which requires the health service to be so responsive in terms of being so supportive of that, that individual, no matter what their choice um, is for the future. So I believe the work of this um, working group has been vital in terms of us to be able to, uh, how we go forward and how we change things. I think that women who find themselves in this scenario need every possible support <coughs> that we can offer. Um, it's a really, really difficult scenario. So I think it's important that we make sure that the the systems, the processes and the practices within the health and social care trusts are fit for purpose and are responsive to the needs of those individuals. So I am grateful for the work of the working group and I look forward to being able to bring forward um, how we're actually going to uh, implement the changes which the group will, re will recommend. I call Naomi Long. Uh, thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, could, could I ask the Minister, and I'm actually following on from the question um, that Mr Kennedy has raised, could I ask the Minister um, what her view is in terms of that panel um, outcome? Because the Justice Minister has already indicated that she will not bring forward legislation in this year, that that's not her intention. So if they recommend legislation, how will that actually be taken forward in a timely manner? Well, I'll, I'll obviously continue to discuss the issue with the Justice Minister. I think we we'll have to be guided by, we've, we've put a working group in place that was um, you know, put in place to do a job, to bring back recommendations on how we need to do, um, do things differently. So it'll be for the executive, I suppose, to decide on, on how we take it forward. But I will bring the report um, as the working group um, produces to me over the next um, number of days. I will bring that report in its entirety to the executive. And if there is a recommendation for legislative change, then I'm certainly up for bringing forward that legislative change, if that's what the group um, recommends. Supplementary for Naomi Long. Um, thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. And I want to thank the Minister um, for her openness in terms of her response um, on the issue. She will be aware that it is three years since um, Sarah Yurt was diagnosed um, and Ellie Yurt passed away, um, very sadly. She will be aware that women who are faced with that diagnosis do not have time on their side when it comes to making their decisions. So would she confirm that she will treat this as a matter of urgency um, to ensure that the decisions that they are having to make um, are treated with respect and dignity that they actually need to be in terms of the courts and the law? Yes, absolutely. I, I can, um, without reservation, say that that's the case. This is a priority. This is an issue which... Um, I believe has been left in the ether for too long. We need to support these women, no matter what their choice is, we need to support these women. So I'm certainly, the working group was established as soon as I came into office, I made sure that the working group um, set about its task. So as I said, I'm going to receive that report in the next number of days and then I intend to bring it to the executive for full consideration. Aaron, Sir Richie McPhillips. I call Richie McPhillips. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that right throughout the West, a quarter of our GP workforce are over age 55 and many of them are soon approaching uh, retirement, which obviously is a huge concern and there's simply no new doctors coming forward to replace them. We've seen the impact of the GP Has shortage the already. A question? Pardon? Has the member a question? We've already seen the shortage in, in Adderley and Rosley, and there's no replacement GP available for the local population. Could the member Can come the minister to provide question, an update please? on what contingency measures her department is taking to tackle this impending rural GP issue? I fully appreciate the, the challenges that there are within um, GP late services and I'm committed to developing a plan that will ensure that there's long term sustainability for GP services. There's particular challenges in rural areas and you've pointed to Fermanagh as an example and that is, um, has been an extremely difficult issue and I can assure the member that the, the board and the trust are working very hard to make sure that um, we do have GP services on the ground delivering for, for patients. 
I've met with um, local representatives from the Royal College of GPs, the BMA, um, GP committee to listen to their um, concerns and I've also um, I'm currently considering the findings on the recommendations of the GP led working group which has made a number of recommendations in terms of identifying future funding priorities for health and social care services here so um, I'm certainly committed to making sure that we do address the issues and the challenges that there are for GP surgeries. Richie McPhillips for a supplement. Thank you and thank the Minister for her answer. Can she update us then, especially in terms of increasing GP places and how newly qualified GPs will be incentivised to work in the rural areas? Well, um, recently, I think it was last year, the, the places went up from 65 to 85, I think it is, and there's certainly a recommendation within the um, GP-led working group that we should look towards raising that, that number even further. So I'm certainly giving consideration to that to make sure that we have the proper workforce and the proper staff and levels to make sure that we have first-class GP services. And I'll continue to work with the Royal College GPs and the BMA in relation to um, addressing the challenges that are identified um, by GPs. Conor Murphy is not in his place. I call Cahill Boylan. Aaron Sir, Cahill Boylan. Carmagan, I previously asked him, Carly. thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I could ask the Minister just for a wee update on the uh, seasonal vaccination flu job. Uh, in the north, the annual seasonal flu vaccination programme is delivered through GP practices and also through school health teams. The vaccine is offered free to those who are considered to be the most, at most risk of developing serious complications if they are infected with an influenza virus, i.e. anyone who's over 65, anyone who's under 65 with certain medical conditions and then all pregnant women. In addition, all preschool children aged two or more can now receive the vaccine by their GP and the vaccine is also offered to all primary school children via the school health service. The annual flu vaccination program is well established and achieves really good uptake um, rates. Boylan for supplementary. I'm all good. I previously last kind of and could thank the Minister for her answer so far, but could I ask the Minister a follow up question in terms of what is the duration of the program? I mean, Would the annual flu programme began on the 3rd of October. Um, the programme runs from October to the end of March. The vast majority of vaccinations should be completed by early December in advance of when the flu season normally reaches its peak. I call Carla Lockhart. Thank you, uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, following a representation from a group recently in Stormont on Huntington's disease, what, uh, what her department is doing to create a, a strategy around helping those with Huntington's disease? I don't have details with me in relation to Huntington's disease, but I'm very happy to provide that to the member in writing in relation to what strategy we have around that particular disease. It's, um, I think it falls into the category of rare diseases and we certainly are working very closely with the rare disease group to, to be able to make sure that we have a proper strategy in place and I think it kicks in by 2020 but I'll give the member more details in relation to Huntington's disease in writing. Carla Lockhart for a supplementary. Thank you and can I thank the Minister for her answer and I certainly look forward to receiving that information. Uh, certainly the concerns raised were very much around the fact that this disease normally manifests again in uh, children um, and, and certainly you can be a carrier of it. So a lot of concern was raised about the fact that you know, early testing uh, and Member I suppose question. I want to just impress upon you the need for early testing for it. And I, I take that on board and actually I did meet the group whenever they were here in Stormont and I had an opportunity to talk to them and that was one of the things that they, they raised with me and the fact that the awareness needs to be raised because it can obviously travel through families so it's important that we do that but I think it's like everything in relation to health and social care, early intervention and prevention is key. As the next period of questions does not begin until 2.45, I suggest the House take its ease until then. Sorry, we don't take point orders in between. You can make it after. <laughs>